Thank you all for staying in late today and coming along to this event. And can I remind you, before we get into the, the main proceedings of the day, that after the lecture, we're going to walk along the corridor and down to B... What's, what's the number of the common room? Is it B... B106 or something? But it, it's... Follow us around and there'll be a glass of wine and a few sandwiches and a bit of crack down there if you're interested. Um, this is a really special day for me. I've been working with this gentleman here for about two and a half years over in Clintock and doing some research in, in a really important area. It's in, in, in the area of crime prevention and the treatment of uh, young adolescents with conduct disorder en route to become professional criminals. Uh, and my colleague and his research group have been investigating a way to prevent that and have shown using rigorous science that in fact their method is highly effective. And, and this particular technique has been imported into Ireland. Uh, my colleague is Professor Tom Sexton from Indiana University. And Tom has a whole bunch of accolades, and I have to write out you know, about seven pages to get them all down. I'll just tell you a few of them. Uh, Tom is a director of the Centre for Adolescent uh, and Family Studies at Indiana University. He's a fellow of the American Psychological Association. Come on in, you missed the best part. Uh, so he's a fellow of the American Psychological Association. He's uh, president, or former president, former former, former president of the uh, American Society for Family Therapy. Um, he's a member of the American Psychological Association Treatment Guidelines Task Force. And in 2011, he received the APA Award uh, or the APA honor of being Family Psychologist of the Year. Uh, Tom is an extraordinary man in the field of, of family therapy. Uh, he was editor of the Handbook of Family Therapy, which is the, the huge big book that contains the, the state of the art and science of, of family therapy. He was editor of the, 19, of the 1993, or 1993 uh, third edition, and is currently editing the fourth edition. And this is the book that those of us in the field of family therapy, all of us look at this book as a kind of the central authoritative source. Um, the work that he's going to talk about today stems from his initial co collaboration much earlier in his career with Jim Alexander, who developed an approach to, <coughs> to family therapy called functional family therapy, which marries together ideas from behavior therapy, from uh, systemic practice, and psychodynamic, there's some psychodynamic ideas in there too. It's a very interesting integrative model. But what's most important about Tom's work is that he has pioneered the, the development of the clinical model and then a system for exporting the clinical model from university-based clinics out into the wilds of the community uh, and indeed all over the world uh, as far afield as can dogger. So this, uh, and it, I mean I thought the results of our study, our little study that we did together, the retrospective study, which is Claire, um, Claire Graham's thesis that Claire and, and Tom and I collaborated on. Uh, the, the very, very interesting results in that little study, which showed that uh, a, a functional family therapy, a model developed in North America, America can be exported uh, into Ireland, that therapists, including the three therapists there in the back row, or, or, or many of you are there, Brandy and Alison, and, or two, are there only three of you? So, oh, yeah, yeah. But, but you have half a dozen of you. Yeah, so there are half a dozen Irish therapists learned how to take this North American model and to implement it in an Irish context and to adapt it to a way that would be acceptable uh, within Ireland. So it's a really great pleasure to, to, for Tom to be here today, or for, for us to welcome Tom to be here today. Um, and, and Tom, will you tell us what you can about functional family therapy over the next hour and a bit? How many days do you have? <laughs> Well, thanks. Thank you all for being here. I don't know if the snow is a good thing or a bad thing. Is that why you didn't really go home? <laughs> because usually you would want to go home. Hey, it's delightful to be here. Is everybody a student? Is that why you're still here? There are students, some students, some non-students? Okay. Uh, well, my students are back in Indiana coding data. And they better be coding data when I'm gone. Otherwise, they're in deep, deep trouble. Um, I have only 93 PowerPoint slides to show you in the next 40 minutes. So I hope you hold on tightly because we're going to go really fast. This introduction by Alan is wonderful. 
I didn't realize that I was important. All I know is that I like to work with families. All I know is that I think juvenile delinquents and kids that are in trouble are brilliant and wonderful. They're honest, they're straightforward, they're passionate about their struggles, and they're willing to tell you in a variety of different kinds of language they're willing to tell you at the top of their lungs and their parents. And I find that to be the most interesting thing. When I was in school, family therapy scared me. It scared me to death to be in a room with a bunch of people that didn't like each other and weren't happy because I didn't know what to do. And quite honestly, when I was in school, no one ever taught me really what I needed to do in the room. So this family therapy thing for me, that Alan has been an integral part of Pioneer, is a very different way of working. It's not just a different technique. It's a different set of glasses. It's a different set of lenses to use to look at the world around you. So in my very brief time today, I'm going to try really hard to talk to you quickly about FFT. And if we have time, I'll show you some examples. We actually have a wonderful videotape that was shot here with an Irish family that uh, I haven't even seen the whole thing of. So I don't know if it's good or not, but Alan tells me I use some of the techniques, which is always a good thing. Um, I have to tell you, because I'm a part of our government, I have a grant. My grant is an NIMH grant to study functional family therapy. It requires me to say to you that that means I'm biased, which means don't believe anything else from here on. <laughs> I work in Indiana University in Bloomington. I was telling someone, it's a wonderful place, but Indiana would be the most conservative place in America, except for our little town. And our little town is a really nice place. We have way more students than we have people. We have 45,000 students, and we have about 40,000, <coughs> or we have about 40,000 people. It's very beautiful, and except that it's got 10 inches of snow right now, like you do. It's a place where we're able to have, you know, it was built on the idea of, of having beautiful places to think great big thoughts. And most importantly, we play basketball. Mm -hmm. And if you're a basketball fan, you should be, because Friday, at 9.45 in the evening, Indiana plays Syracuse to move to what we call the Elite Eight, which is a big thing for us. So basketball is really big in our university. What I do there is that I run a research center, I teach in a program with doctoral students, and I see families. You know, one of the things I decided to do when I became an academic was never give up the opportunity and the activity of actually seeing clients. I don't know that you can be a good researcher if you can't sit in the therapy room. If you don't sit in the therapy room, you don't have the feel of what goes on. On the other hand, if you can't think scientifically, being a therapist is going to be a very difficult thing to do. So for me, the combination of both is what's brilliant, and that's what I get to do. Actually, there's a different reason that I'm really here. It has nothing to do with FFT. It has to do with this. Today, um, there'll be in this Alan really downplayed it, but after we're done, we're going to get together and talk about the book, and uh, it's a brilliant, brilliant contribution to the field. I have a lot of wonderful things to say, and I'll say a few words when we get ready for the, uh, for the sandwiches, the glass of wine, and the other things, so please join us. In general, I think textbooks hold us back, not this one. This one moves us forward, because this isn't the same idea as regurgitated. These are new ideas, new ideas put in a new way. The FFT story is an interesting one. Unlike other models of treatment, FFT, which has been around 40 years, has changed in the 40 years. As Alan said, the progenitor of FFT, Jim Alexander, was basically a psychodynamic therapist. He had all the psychodynamic ideas. And it was a two-phase model. The idea in the early days was, if you could find a way to engage people, then you could turn the rest over to a, a kind of a technologist who could teach them parenting skills, and then you'd be done. That was in 1973. In that time, between 1973 and now, we've evolved in the theory. And I've been able to really be lucky to be part of the evolution of the theory. And theoretical models need to change. They need to evolve like people. They need to grow and be different. That's what's nice about Alan's book. Alan doesn't present theories just as they were. Alan presents theories in the new lens of how they are. And so that's really what we've been able to do in FFT, which is nice. Now FFT is a combination of social constructionism, it's a combination of social influence theory, it's a combination of attribution theory, all of the things that have come since 1973. 
That's also been pushed for us by science. The early studies were simple. We just compared two groups. Did one get better than another? On the other hand, we also looked at process. And up until now, we're doing a study in Clondalkin. So the science has continued, not just the science of outcome, but the science of what goes on in the black box. Most therapies don't pay attention to how you get from where someone is to the end product, which hopefully is a good outcome. One of the things FFT has done is been able to do the science. And then lastly, what I think is one of the nice things about FFT is it's changed because of practice. It is not done in a university clinic in a sterile research environment. Every single time we teach someone to do FFT, we learn more about how it works. Every time I walk into a room with a family, I learn more about how it works. So it's this combination of theory and new ideas in the evolution of a model, the continuing science, and learning from the people we should learn from, which are clients. Families, youth, their parents, they have a story to tell us. They have a story to tell us about how change works. And in FFT, we've been very lucky because right now we think somewhere in the world, on, in every day, FFT is done in one of eight or nine different languages. That's kind of a remarkable accomplishment for a psychological therapy, most of which, most of them are, culturally and language based. And the reason FFT has been able to do that, as I'm going to show you in a minute, is the process of it is not about the content of what people say. It's about the process of what goes on between people. And it seems as those, though those processes between people are universal. They're not just cultural, but they seem to cross barriers. And that's been one of the lucky things for us. Let me show you the kind of person that we deal with, because these are interesting people. Get a little bit better. How it makes them different from any of the other six hundred that I've been to. You think I ever talked to people like you before? It's it different, yeah. What she's saying is, but it makes it won't different. Won't be? Oh, wait, why won't, why won't you just want to keep because going? Because I don't want you. I don't why want you, you to help me. I don't want you. I don't want them. I don't want you. I don't want you. I want you to shut up and leave me alone. All of you. Shut up and leave me alone. And then what's going to happen to you? I'm going to do it myself. I don't want anything. I will take care of myself. Stop worrying about me. You stop. Take care of yourself. See, you don't know that. You're stupid. You're stupid. You're stupid. You're stupid. You don't know me. You don't know me. You don't know me. People fucking know me. And you should fucking bother me. You don't leave me alone. You don't let me do anything. You just, uh, stop trying to help me. Stop! 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 Alright? Let me help myself. I don't want your help. I don't want your help. I don't want your help. I don't want anybody's help but my own. And I'm not going to let anybody help me. Will you? There you go. That's what you have to deal with when you do this kind of work. This young man started at 10 or 11 sticking his finger down his throat and scratching it though so he would spit up blood, so he didn't have to go to school. He went from sticking his finger down his throat to pencils and knives. He went from there to being put in psychiatric institutes, being seen by psychiatrists, taking all sorts of medication, until he went to middle school and discovered marijuana. It helped him. The bad news is it put him in contact with very bad peers. And those bad peers got him in great trouble. And the day that he took a gun to school, not to hurt anybody, but the truth being to hold it for somebody else, and honest to goodness, most kids say that, but this was the truth, he ended up in the, in the juvenile justice system. The likelihood that this young man stays in the juvenile justice system in the United States is about 85%. Once you're in, you rarely get out. And if you're in the juvenile justice system, it means school is hard, it means you get labeled, it means you get monitored, and I would challenge any one of you to survive having an ankle bracelet, having a probation officer watch you that closely, and not get in trouble again. Two more times into trouble, they send him away from home. Once they send him away from home, either to a psychiatric institution or to a juvenile facility, his life changes even worse because then his peers become real criminals. This young man is on his way to a very difficult situation. 
This is what treatment people are faced with. The FFT therapists in the back of the room, all of you, when you do the clinical work you do, you have to find a way to take this young man and his family from where they are and move them to a place where they can collaboratively work together to solve the problems that he has to solve. And he has many, many problems to solve. It is not that he is that he's doing well. The question is how can we get him to let us help him? And clearly, that's not where he is today. These are the kind of kids that helped us develop FFT. Because one of the things that psychological treatments do very poorly is engage people. My students still tell me the same thing. Yeah, I saw that client. Yeah, I did. They didn't want to change. So I didn't schedule another appointment because they weren't ready to change yet. And my thought is, what? It's our job to help find a way to engage and motivate. And therein lies the key to FFT. Motivation for change and engagement in therapy is not the client. It is the therapist and the treatment model's responsibility. So for us, if you think about that young man, you can think about it from his perspective. Be him for a minute. What does he need? Well, he clearly needs something and work that fits his norms and his values. This is a young man that says he's independent. This is a young man that says he can do it on his own. This is a young man that says he's going to help himself. You're not going to change that. You have to find a way to engage with that. You have to find a way to help him take him from where he is and change that. You've got to help him out of the discouragement. Screaming like that is not badness. Screaming like that is hurt. Screaming like that is discouragement. And it's the therapeutic process's goal to try to help him with that. And, and again, I've been doing this a long time like Alan. We rarely take our psychological treatments and make them fit the client. We more frequently try to make the client fit the treatment. We've got to find a way to wrap the treatment around him and his family so that there is some way in the world that they can move ahead and at the end of the day, it's all fine and good to talk about how people feel. They've got to have practical tools to do something. He's got to go to school. You know what? Even if he doesn't want to, he needs to stop smoking marijuana. And he needs to have different peers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is the therapeutic challenge. This is the real life challenge. So to successfully deal with kids from our perspective, it takes a couple things. First of all, and one of the things that FFT does well, is it, attack, it, it takes an approach called what we call an, an inside-out approach rather than an outside-in approach. The young man you saw, those are the dads. His dad's a dealer. His dad's a blackjack dealer. So sorry, you thought drug dealer, but he lives in Las Vegas, so he deals blackjack. But he's an alcoholic and he hasn't been in his life ever. Many people want and believe that a intact family of a mother and a father is the best way to raise a kid. In some cases, yes. In some cases, not. So in this particular case, we've got to find a way to do something that fits him. And if you look at how he works with his mom and understand first how they function, then we can figure out how to help him, rather than looking at him until, and then coming up with all the ways that they mess up. So this is a very different way of thinking about it. Start inside and think about how they work and move out rather than the outside in approach. And you know what's interesting about this is this is, a, this is not just an FFT, but this is a hallmark of family therapies. Family therapies have always done an exceptional job at this. And what's interesting what Alan's book does that's so brilliant is that we know that family therapies are the best way, the most promising approaches to kids with drug problems. Family therapies are the best way to help people with behavior problems. They're the best way with chronic adult schizophrenics to reduce hospitalizations. Family therapies are one of the best ways in a couple, couple therapies, the best way to help one of a couple with depression. And these therapies are probably the future of substance abuse, alcohol abuse disorder treatment. Really good data. The problem is we rarely, rarely use them in treatment. Now what Alan's book does, and what I think is really wonderful, is that family therapies have evolved over a very long time. They're no longer the treatments that I learned about or the models that I learned about when I started. 
You know, quite honestly, the reason I don't like textbooks, quite honestly, is because they're the same books that I have. They just have a new cover and a new author. They're no different, except for this book. And I, I, I quite honestly mean it. This book really does something quite different. We started, and family therapies start with a way of thinking. It's a systemic way of thinking. And it's a, it means don't think about just what's inside somebody, but think about what's between people. That systemic way of thinking was a dramatic change. From that came a lot of interesting theories. That's what we do in our business. We take good ideas and reify them with names and developers, and we make them approaches. And we have some great ones in family therapy, the early structural things, the later second generation integrative and, and uh, other kinds of approaches. And now things have changed even more. There is a set and a group of family therapies now that has reached a bit of a different place because now they're science-based. Alan said I serve on the APA Task Force for Treatment Guidelines. Family therapies are some of the largest, they, they're some of the most numerous approaches that have good science behind them. They are wonderful approaches. Now, the bad news is we rarely use them because despite all of their outcomes, if you work in the health service or if you work in treatment or in mental health in America, you don't do family therapy. You rarely do it. There's a lot of reasons. Some of it's training. I have students that come to me to learn family therapy. They were taught that they're supposed to sit and listen, nod their head, sit in an open position and reflect and paraphrase, summarize occasionally, and ask the client what they want. It's all good. That's a useful thing to do. But if you were to ask that young man's parents what he wants, they want, they want him to quit and stop. If you were to ask him what he wants, he would tell you he wants them to leave him alone. It doesn't help to do that. So, so some of the initial imprinting that you all go through and I went through sets us up to think in a certain way. Also, I don't know how you get paid here for services, but in America when you get paid for services, you get paid by doing individual treatment. You don't get paid. Our diagnostic systems are all individual. Our conceptualization of problems are individual. And family therapy tends to be used in situations as an add-on, not a mainstay treatment. That's confusing to me, given that there, it's, it's a group of things that has the best data that there is. Now, FFT has come along in this evolution of science and theory and things like that, and it's filled a really nice role. And I'm going to try to talk really quickly about some of the unique things, but it is a client-centered approach, very much. It's also an evidence-based treatment. And I'm not sure what you think about evidence-based treatments. There's a lot of controversy. It's very programmed. It's very systematic. These, these FFT therapists in the back, they follow a model. They follow goals in each phase. It is not the client they follow, it's the model they follow. It is still client-centered and family-based. We do conjoint therapy. We don't see people individually, because it's easier. We see everybody in the room at the same time and appreciate what you saw on the video. At the same time, we try to work with adolescents in both treatment and prevention and prevention settings. And you know what? Some of the best treatments are quick and short and easy. The idea is get in, get out, let them function and let them live their life. It doesn't longer is not that. Now FFT is um, built on kind of a brilliant idea, and I say brilliant based in kind of a joke. You're not a laughing crowd, so I'll have to point out where the jokes are for you so that you're able to kind of see them. I don't know if this is an Irish thing or an American thing, but you know. So I'll let you know every time there's a joke that way you can respond appropriately, and then I'll feel better, and then you'll feel like you're a good audience, and we'll all be good. So our brilliant idea is that you do different things in the beginning than you do in the middle and the end. Well, most people would say yes, but most people don't do that. They just respond in the moment to whatever happens. Now, the bad news about that is if you have a rough day, you tend to respond by saying, today I'm going to be confrontive. I don't know who that's for, for the therapist or for the client. A joke. But you can't tell. So our idea is this. In the, at the beginning, Start with the junk between people or start with the conflict between people. The first step is not to fix them. Don't give them homework, by the way. Forget give. Isn't that funny? We have kids that don't go to school and we give them homework. 
to go home from our psychological treatments. I don't get that either. But the point is, let's start with getting rid of the things between them. Because, folks, the honest truth is the solutions to problems are brilliantly simple. Stop it. Don't do it again. Be nice. Work together with people. I mean, it's really easy. Don't do drugs. Go to school. Don't hit people. Be nice to your parents. Listen. And, you know, treat your kids like normal people. It's easy. Why don't people do that? People don't do that not because it's not easy, but because of what has developed between them over time. And our data has showed us that, shown us that it is negativity and blame that get people caught and stuck. Think about it in your own life. When someone in my life that's important to me comes to me like this, my first response is to respond with this. And then it goes downhill from there. So step one has got to be forget the skill, forget the teaching, work out and reduce the conflict between them. If you can do that, it's time to build behavioral competencies. Not as a curriculum, but as something that fits them. And if you're successful at that, it's time to move outside the family then and work with peers and schools and the other contexts in which they work. Work inside, build new skills, move to the outside. Follow those steps along the way. Well, that's a nice thing, but that would never sell as a good model, right? So you've got to make it prettier. And so FFT's model is much simpler, or is much nicer in that way. We have three phases of, of treatment. First, the part that gets rid of the negativity and the blame is called engagement and motivation. Our job is to bring them into treatment, make it relevant to them, make it fit a need that they have, make it a place that they get something. And one way you do that is not by promising it, but by doing it. If they walk out of the first session with you, and they don't even have to know what you did. They don't even have to like you. If they walk out and it's different than it is at home, you're, you've got a, you're a winner. If the next time they walk out and it's different again, you're a winner. If you make your hour with them different than home, it's better. And you can move forward. In the middle, we call it behavior change, probably misnamed, because the behaviors change in the beginning too. Think about it in your life. As you soften your approach to, to those significant people in your life, you treat them nicer. You treat them nicer, they treat you nicer, things go better. That works for a while. But you need to have a set of skills that are different. Whether that be listening, solving problems, whether it be managing conflicts different, whatever it is, those skills can be added on the good culture and contact between people. That's our behavior change phase. And then lastly, Few psychological therapies and most psychological therapies end way before they're done. And the reason is because clients are better. They feel better. Any of you ever had antibiotics recently or any time? You know, at least in the States, they come with this really big label on the side. And the label says, take all of these pills even though you feel better. I don't know about your health insurance, but mine's very expensive. So when I get medications, I take them all anyway, but some people don't. The reason is because you feel better. But what happens with antibiotics is you get sick again, and when you get sick, you get worse because your body has built some resistance. The way that translates in a family with a behavior disorder kids is this way. Dr. Sexton, thank you for your help, but you didn't go to school today, and we're done with it. We've tried all the things that you had to offer us, and it just didn't work. We're finished. We're going to send them away. That's relapse. Psychological treatments need to do relapse at the end so that relapse prevention, generalizing to the outside, and systematic attention to maintaining change can happen. So you start inside, you build competencies, you systematically move outside, and then there's two threads that go between these. One is assessment and one is intervention. Notice in this model, we don't have an assessment phase. Assessment happens all the time depending on the phase you're in. In the beginning, you're assessing the things that go on between them. In the middle, you're assessing the degree to which they have skills or need them. And at the end, you're assessing what outside contacts and contexts may get in their way. Intervention, you know that you, there is no magic to what we do, don't you? 
Sorry, but there's no magic. Really, not. You know who the magic is? It's you. And you know the magic is just in conversation. That's all. You have nothing to offer but words and experiences in a room when you sit and talk with them. Intervention is every single thing you do. When you respond, when you choose to talk to him rather than him, or to her rather than to her, in this big complicated conversation, you're intervening. The more that can be purposeful, the better. So for us, it's phases, a temporal direction, where there's intervention and assessment that go on all along. And we have very specific outcomes. The beginning, we want them to be able to work together and reduce negativity. In the middle, we want them to have competencies to handle problems. And at the end, we want them to continue and to maintain that because the truth, folks, is that the problems will never end. Therapies like FFT do not end problems. They empower people to be able to manage those problems in hopefully a more functional way. Now, we've got a lot of data. I'm going to do this really quickly, but we've got some data that starts Jim Alexander's work in 1973. FFT compared not to nothing, but it was a mistake. I mean, it wasn't planned this way. Typically, you compare treatments to absolute comparisons at the beginning, right? He didn't do that. He compared it to another family therapy. Didn't do so. FFT did much better than the other family therapy. He, next, he included two alternative pro, uh, options. One is a no treatment co control, and one is having a probation officer. Guess what? FFT was better, but guess what was way worse? The other psychological treatment. And then a similar study in the end. There's twins, I mean, there's sibling studies. There's studies that show communication improved. There's studies that show conflict goes down. Those span about 35 years of fairly solid data. Now, we have some other studies. We did a really large study in the state of Washington. What's really nice about this is it's not in a lab with a bunch of highly trained therapists that only do this intervention, but they're regular, everyday folks that work in community settings. The outcome was we were able to reduce felony crime significantly, violent crime. The number that should be there is every dollar that went into training and treatment produced a $14 return. Pretty good, right? I'd like to get that on my bank account, but I'm not. And it was very cheap to implement. <coughs> but here's the interesting thing. We found a couple, we found the FFT group, and again, things change, they get worse over time, but at the end, 16 out of 100 kids got in trouble for anything. At the end of the 12-session, three-month intervention, and these were kids where half of them were in gangs, more than half were kicked out of school, 80% had drug, alcohol problems. They were not easy kids. You can see that it can make a difference. Now, what's interesting is here in Ireland, with Claire's wonderful study, uh, the retrospective study, we compared parents and adolescents of kids, and we compared them uh, at the end of treatment, and you can see they got better. And they, from their perspective, rated therapy as much better. Now, the other part of the retrospective study here that Alan mentioned earlier is this. It depends on how well you do the intervention to how well it works. That's one of those, from my perspective, duh kind of things. My son does that all the time, right? I'll say something and he'll go, duh. That's supposed to mean like, I'm not sure what it means. I act like I know what it means, but I think it sort of means, well, of course. But I'm not so sure. But anyway, it's one of those duh findings, right? If you are really good at this, you're going to make a lot of big difference in reducing symptoms. If you're not so good at it, you're going to make less of an impact. And then if you compare it to people that don't finish, that's even better. It's got to be done well. And you can see we all, in the, in the retrospective study of the folks back here, it was these three people's work. I mean, it's not like people you don't know. They're real life people with clients. You can tell the same thing happens with conduct problems. And you can see 40% of the people are going to get better compared to these other care groups. That's a pretty dramatic outcome. And this is with looking back, taking old cases, nothing special, no super randomized trial. Now, I think that FFT is unique in some ways. 
And one of the reasons it can produce those results is because it's not like most evidence-based treatments. Here's why. Let me put some funny words together. Purposely creative. Well, when you think of somebody creative, you don't think of them being very purposeful, do you? You think of creative people as being just somehow from somewhere they do brilliant things. In therapy, that means usually they're purposeful. They know what they're doing, they do it for a reason, and there are good outcomes. When great therapists work, and you watch their work, it looks like magic, but folks, really there's a purpose and a rhyme and a reason behind what they do. From our perspective, FFT is flexibly structured. It's got a very clear structure, but there's flexibility to it because families are not the same. FFT, from our perspective, is client-centered and model-focused, and change is guided by the model. FFT therapists follow the model, but what they do is that it's driven by the family and how they work. Now this looks kind of weird, doesn't it? How can you put these words together and have a systematic approach? And it's because we take this inside-out approach. And I have to say, FFT works not because of the model, but because of the people that do it. And every psychological treatment, in my view, works in the same way. You don't, families don't take the treatment. They interact with the therapist. It is the therapist that translates the treatment. And treatments are translated in a particular way. And the better and more creatively they're translated, the better the outcome. But what helps a therapist be creative? I'm going to do this in kind of an easy way. It takes three things. It depends on how you look at things. It depends on the map that you follow. And it depends on being artful in your implementation. Now, maps are interesting. I mean, uh, lenses are interesting. I talk to really large groups of people sometimes. Sometimes I get really nervous. So what I do is, you know, you're given all these things you're supposed to do to get unnervous, like imagine everybody's naked. That doesn't help. That's, I just get kind of scared and I want to leave the room when that happens. So instead, if I just do this, honest to goodness, you know, the cool thing is, you're gone. And you're back. So, you know, it's how you look at something that matters. And it, everything starts with what you look at. Now, once you look at things in a particular way, you've got to find your way from the beginning to the end. You've got to follow a map. And in the end, you have to do that in a creative way. So lenses can be enormously complicated. And here's our lens. We take a very multi-systemic way. What walks in the door? What you get presented with are symptoms. But that's not the only thing you have to look at and see when you see this young man that we looked at. When you see him, you can't just pay attention to his diagnosis and the bad behaviors. He's more than that. He's got a system around him, a complicated system. He's got 15 years of, he's got 21 years of his parents in conflict. They've been married 21 years and separated for 11. Now that's different. That doesn't happen real frequently. Um, he's got a reputation in school. He can't even go to a school because everybody in the whole district knows it. He's got peers, et cetera, et cetera. That's a context that's important. And I have to say, he's got a biological predisposition to the kind of things that he does as well that are really serious. And I have to say there's another part. It's the family. The way in which he and his mom and his dad have come to work are a large part of what you have to see. So this is a complicated way of looking at a case. So as an FFT therapist, this is what you have to do. You have to make some of it go away at the beginning. What's important at the beginning is to look at not just the symptom and how that family has incorporated the system into how they work, but you have to look at the way in which it fits in. You probably used to know a lot of people with kids with ADHD. Difficult problem, very hard. Some families, ADHD is just a thing. Other families, ADHD <coughs> is another member of the family. They're tied to the, to the disorder. Sometimes we look at families and we know that there's the mom, the dad, the kid, and delinquency that all pull up a chair for dinner at night. And the bad behaviors can become part of who they are. And our goal in FFT in the lens is to figure out how that works. So our job in the lens we look at is not what is the diagnosis, but how do they work? 
quite honestly, oppositional defiant disorder and conduct disorder don't mean very much to me. I mean, I know what they are, I know what the criteria are, but they don't mean anything. Every single family I work with works differently with a set of behaviors that can be labeled that. And so, if you want to change somebody, let's imagine that this young man has been traumatized. You don't change traumas. You change how families integrate and function around those events, behaviors, and activities. So FFT's point of entry is around the connection between the symptom and the relational system. Now some of this has to do with what we think the problems are. So, you know, what's interesting is a lot of therapies want to know why. And, you know, we're all curious about why. And if you do clinical work, I know you sat there like I have, and you asked yourself the question, why? Why do they do this? Parents want to know why. They want to know the root cause. Is it a trauma? That's our new thing. Trauma, trauma's everywhere. And trauma's real, but it's now the cause of lots of things. When you think this way, it directs you in a particular way. To, to be a CSI detective, it makes you go search for the cause and get rid of it, like a surgeon. Cut it out. We can't do that in our work. Instead, in our work, what we have to do is look at something different. The problem in this case lies in the person. From an FFT perspective, I don't really care why. You know, FFT is built on that systemic principle of equifinality. There's a million ways to get to where they are. Who cares? The question now is how do they work? What are the patterns? How do they move information around? How do they work as a family? You've seen these, right? Now, is this horses or a lady? Depends on what you look at, right? Is, it, is this a bigger ground or is it a person? Is it a vase or is it two people? Thinking relationally in the lens that FFT uses is a figure ground problem. You've got to stop looking inside. You've got to back away and look at what goes on between. When you have that lens, you're able to look at what we call relational patterns. And relational patterns means you don't stop at what he did or why, but you back away and look at the whole. What comes before, what comes after, what this means to them. And these patterns from our perspective are pervasive. They involve everybody. They're a little like a roller coaster ride. They always start at the same place and end at the same place. The only difference is what they fight about. <coughs> no difference if you can do the figure ground and see the pattern rather than the behavior. And I'm not going to go through this, but these patterns become enormously complicated. Here's a young man that fights with his mom, right? If you stop at this point, you don't have to read this, you would try to get the mom to be nicer to him. Yeah, then she talks to her husband in the middle. If you were to just look at that part, you'd say that the husband should pay more attention and work harder. The boy comes home, the husband's stepfather is all over him. The boy's not so nice. You could try to get the boy to be more respectful. And at the end, the mom and the boy make up. And who's the bad guy at the end of the day? The stepfather. Patterns are complicated. And if you look at a pattern perspective, rather than a causal perspective, you have a lens that can help you work with families. That's a good beginning, seeing what's there. But once you see it, you have to go somewhere with it. The young man you saw on the tape, we have to take him someplace. We have to take him to a different place. And for me, that's about maps. You know, it really helps if you're going to go someplace you don't know how to map. It really helps. I mean, you know, have you ever packed up your car for a vacation? pulled out of the garage, got on the street, taken off, and said, where should we go? Not a good approach when you have a lot of little kids. It was a good approach when I was a teenager and I wanted to discover the world. But having a map is nice. It tells you where to go. It's an efficient way to get somewhere. So maps are important. And as I told you, this is our map. The map that shows how we go about this and how we try to get people to change. The therapist follows a map with this lens about how we see things. And that map for the therapist has markers along the way. These markers are like rest stops. They're like, they're like parts along the way in the map that you see and you know you're making progress. Therapists don't move on until they hit the outcome. Now the first phase is a phase of trying to bring the person in. 
And what is our goal? We look at a thing called problem definitions. It doesn't matter to us what's right. We don't really care the truth. We care what everybody thinks is the matter because that's what they struggle with. If the parents think he's disrespectful and the, and the kid thinks that they're all over him, that's a clash in problems. So at this simplest place, if you look interactionally, they're fighting because they're so trying to solve different problems. Our interventions are things like reframing, developing organizing themes, and yes, indeed, folks, one of the interventions is to do things like ignore certain things, interrupt people, change the subject, don't let negativity and blame be in the room. And sometimes I do that, they fight, and I go, huh, Alan, what do you think about? And I just totally change the subject. Anything that you can do. Reframing is a particularly good way to do it because it builds a common problem definition and it moves people forward. And our goal are the goals of the phase. So here's our job. You know, people come in, one of the unique things about people is we're self-reflective. All of us try to figure out what's the matter. You do it. You do it every day. When I come to visit the Klondokan people, the family first people, one of the first things I think is, why is the traffic like this? Why didn't they do something about this, these people in Ireland and Dublin? I mean, you know, how do they live with this, right? And I start to attribute cause somewhere. You've had a bit of a financial crisis. You've tried to attribute cause someplace, right? Once you attribute cause, then that's the thing that all your solutions focus around. Once parents decide that their young son, Alan, is disrespectful, you know, it's only natural they're going to try to make him more respectful. They're going to lecture him, they're going to tell him, they're going to do this and that. What if they saw him as someone that had, didn't have the social skills to be nice? They would take an entirely different approach to him. Reframing and changing problem definitions has three parts. It's got an attributional part, there's an emotional part that comes with it, and a set of behaviors. And our goal is to take their presenting problem definitions and come up with a common one that's shared by everybody. And folks, isn't that what alliance is? Alliance is being on the same page. Now the interesting thing with FFT is we don't put them on the same page. We have to build a page for them to be on. There is no page for them to be on. So the beginning work of FFT is finding a way to describe them, their situation, and their family in a way that puts them on that builds a page that they can work together on. Now that's not easy. It takes relentless, relentless <coughs> attention to trying to take each thing and reframe it. Let me really quickly do this because reframing is something you've all heard about, right? Co positive connotation. That's taking lemons and making lemonade. No? It's a nice thing. We've had it in family therapy forever. FFT's approach is a little bit different because it's a relational reframing and we look at it as not an event but a process. Reframing is like, and this is appropriate metaphor for today, it's like building a snow person. Reframing means you start with a snowball and you roll it and every time you roll it you build a layer and every time you build a layer you add more to it. And so reframing helps us do that. Now, the funny thing is reframing does not start with telling people what they need to add. Reframing starts with agreeing with them. If you want to bring people into your treatment, you have to show them that you get where they stand. So actually, the first part of reframing is to say yes. The second part, and when you say yes, you frame an event, you acknowledge its importance to the person, and that can be through a description. And lo and behold, you should be reframing and, and acknowledging the bad things that happened. Yes, Claire, I know you threw the chair. Was it a big chair or a small chair? Did you hit him in the head or did you miss him? It's okay to talk about bad stuff. You have to acknowledge it. Now, when you do that, what you get is alliance. That's what we want. Well, that's not enough because you have to follow your yes with a fairly immediate <coughs> hand. Because just agreeing is not enough. You've got to agree and you have to add something new to the room. And therein you add a 
theme, we call them themes, that builds the page the family can be on together. And maybe what it does is it changes the meaning of something. You know, Alan's behavior is really not that he's disrespectful. He just doesn't know what to do in large crowds. Different, different meaning. It may be that we link people together. It may be that we make them wonder about the future. And then thirdly, again, surprisingly not done in lots of therapies, you have to stop and listen to what they, how they respond. Because whatever they say is grist for the next thing that you say, and reframing goes around and around, and builds layer after layer. Works. You reduce negativity and blame, and guess what? They stay in treatment. We've had a study where we have completers and non-completers. They start in the same way if you take a, if you do rating analysis and you look in the first session, they start at the same place in terms of negativity. Guess what? The people that are going to end up doing the best, it gets more negative in the middle of 20 minutes. But you know where the difference is? By the time they walk out, that explosion of negativity has gotten better. The people that drop out, they have been able to honestly and openly express their feelings, right? That's always not such a good thing, by the way. And it doesn't work out well for them. So, our job here is to do this, and guess what, folks? The way it works in real treatment is this. Somebody says something. I hear it in my lens as a problem definition, and I respond by framing it and reframing it, and you know what? Then they tell me more. And then you know what? Someone else jumps in and says something. And you know what I do? The good news is I frame it and I reframe it, and then guess what? They're going to tell me more. And then someone else jumps in, and it goes around and around and around. <coughs> and that's good, as long as every time around you add a new layer to what goes on. The middle phase? The middle phase is a little different. We used to think that the middle phase was in a curriculum where you teach them a bunch of things, right? And the things to teach them are fairly clear from the literature. Delinquent kids, families don't communicate well, they don't problem solve, they rarely negotiate, they don't know how to manage conflicts. Sets of skills, right? Lots of people give handouts, they do lessons. Bad news is that that's like homework and they don't do it. You've got to fit it into them and how they work. So first, we've got to identify the skill, find the barriers, and make a target. And what we've learned in the last four or five years is there's no single skill. We have to build an individualized set of skills that fits them. It's always a little communication, a little problem solving, some conflict management, based on the unique case. And the goal is that they have something to do differently, they do it, it matches them, and they put it into practice. So we, we try to be simpler and simpler all the time. In behavior change, it's really pretty simple. Whatever you end up talking about that the, the problem is, our idea is that the goal is to work it out somehow. What does it take to work it out? It takes good parenting. Listening, responding, supervising, it takes good communication. It takes conflict management to do this. So we've moved away from discrete skills that all get taught like a classroom experience to an individualized approach. Sounds all great, right? Puts enormous pressure on the therapist. That's not an easy thing to do. So it's not a curriculum, and we do it in terms of matching. Now at the end, like I said, if you want them to keep it going, You've got to help them, because they're feeling better. Three things. Support. A lot of the families that we work with need help. Now, I want to suggest to you that the best help they can get is not from people like us. The best help they can get is from their family and their community. If they can find support systems in the community and in their own family, those last. You know how the health service changes from one week to another. You don't want your families depending on that. And guess what? They work with Alan one week, they work with Claire the next week, they work with you the next week. They're going to get something different, different treatments. So we, in the end, try to support the great changes they've made by helping link them to supports that help, that are indigenous to them, that they can keep going. Secondly, we want to help them generalize. You know, it's funny for families, right? They feel like every problem is a new one. Lo and behold, it isn't a new one. They're all kind of the same. 
they don't feel it that way. So you've got to help them bring the same set of skills to these seemingly different problems. And then lastly, it isn't going to be easy. The problems are not done. This is not like a physical problem where if you get the right diagnosis and treatment, you're better and it's over. Not at all. In fact, the next day there'll be a new problem, the next day five, the next day ten. The goal for relapse prevention is to empower people to take on those problems as a normal part of their life in a different way. So guess what? They don't have to come back to us and the revolving door of mental health care doesn't continue. So in this last phase, we work very hard to no matter what we talk about is to try to build in and generalize these other factors. The last thing, and I'm going to make it, maybe, but the last thing is this. All that is really nice and well said, right? Sounds so. At the end of the day, it is the therapist that translates this in practice. You saw the young man on the tape, right? Not an easy kid. Uh, if we had longer, I could show you what you could do with him. If I had longer, we could show you what we were, did with a couple of Irish families that we have tapes to watch with. I mean, when we did some work with. You've got to try to find a way to be artful. And therapy is an art. But it's a funny kind of way of thinking about art. Because I have to tell you, this discussion of art has all to do with my car. That's a joke, too, although not real. I drive a Prius. Anybody ever been in a Prius? Really? Nobody. Oh, they're great cars. But beyond being a great car, there's something other thing that's very special. It's a little like this thing that I always wear that tells me how many steps I walk. It's also a little bit like why my bathroom scale that I stand on to weigh myself sends my weight to the router in my house, which goes to my a website, which goes to my house. I know, I'm data addicted. I'm kind of dangerous. <laughs> but there is something about creativity that has to do with, I know, Kind of weird. So anyway, the idea is, what is creativity? Well, there's a reason we don't pay attention to this, because here's the real deal. Things as good as they are, like FFT, MST, uh, multidimensional family therapy, the other great treatments about that. You know what happens when you put them in the real world? About half the effect size goes away. Why? Because in real life, you've got 40 clients to see in a week. In real life, you don't work in a place that allows you to be flexible. In real life, you're constrained by paperwork and billing and everything else. It's not so easy. So we've got to figure out how to get beyond paint by the numbers models. And I have to tell you, the structure of models is also being, being getting in our way because of model developers like me. If people like me are not careful, we tend to put a little more faith in our work than we should. These are just ideas. And the truth be told, 10 years from now, there shouldn't be an FFT, there should be an FFT dash something, 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 right? It should build and grow. And I have colleagues that like to do what they've done for 30 years. It's what they've always done, but models need to grow. And quite honestly, we're kind of stuck which is one of the reasons, I'll say one more time, I really like Alan's book. Because he presents it in a way that's not stuck. But he puts it into what you can do about it. So think about this. Anybody here a musician? One music, two musicians and no Prius owners. This is really good because this means I can make up about anything I want to say and you'll believe it. What do you do? What do you sing and play? Oh, good. And you? I was, a, I was a pretend musician when I was in graduate school, meaning I went to graduate school all day and I played in bar bands at night to drunk people. I got to recommend that as a graduate school way, go away going to graduate school, it's great. It really grounds you in what's real. Um, and I also never want to hear anybody yell to me again and play Freebird. <laughs> um, but I got, to, I, got to know, I got to know musicians and I got to, I, I'm a curious person, so I always try to figure out how people think. And you know what really great musicians do? They don't play the notes. They play between the notes. They play around the notes, and really great musicians play the spaces between the notes. And guess what would happen if you took all the notes away? There's nothing to play around and play between. 
You know, the interesting thing about creativity is we frequently see it as some brilliance that comes out of nowhere. It isn't. It is built and it exists because of the structure in which it happens. So jazz, for example, is playing between the notes. And there are some jazz players that say some interesting things, like it's an art based on improvisation, but you've got to learn to be creative. I don't know if that was your case, but you got to learn how to do it. And when you're creative, you learn the basics, and then you sort of let them go because you know them so well, you can play between them. And if you're a great musician, you just don't play whatever you want. You've got to blend into the group around you. Creativity is not random. Creativity is built on structure. In therapy, it's the same way. Most creative therapists, from Carl Whitaker to Salman Nuchin to Jim Alexander and other people that are really brilliant and great, they have a structure that they follow in a way that they think that is so much them that it's in the background and they don't think about it and they just do the work and they play between and around the events that happen. They make something happen with whatever occurs in the room. So that's how it has to do with my car, if you were wondering. One of the great things about my car is it's got some high techness to it, right? So it's got a GPS device, but my car gives me feedback. So there's my car again, and my car has some interesting things. Just like your car, I'm sure, it's got maps, and it's got little navigation things, but your car doesn't have this. My car has this really big screen in it. And that screen, should, by the way, don't do this. This is me driving with my iPhone, taking a picture. No, that's not a good thing. Um, but it's got a thing, and you can't see it. It says 46.8 miles to the gallon. I'm addicted by that thing, quite honestly. If I could get it to 47, I'd, I'd, feel, I'd have a great day. If I can get to 47.1, well, I'm feeling good. I, my goal is to make that go up. The only way I know that I have a goal is for that information to come back to me. I know. You gotta do something to entertain yourself, right? <laughs> yeah. So this is, and it gives me feedback every five minutes of my gas mileage. So I'm watching it to try to get, so I now coast down hills. Actually, the truth is my son won't ride with me anymore. He says, Dad, I gotta get there sometime today. It can't be next week. So I, I'm addicted to the feedback. Let's turn that into a psychological therapy. What would happen, and this is part of FFT, what would happen if you were able to get feedback session by session on how well you were doing? How much the client was changing and how they were, how they were doing? What would happen if you got that every week? It would change your behavior. You would alter what you did. You would be able to be creative around the structure of FFT. You would know to pay more attention to the mom, the dad, the kid, the symptom, the this, the that. We've built a system like this, a measurement feedback system. We've had one a long time, but this version is a collaboration with Len Dickman at Vanderbilt University. We're now, every FFT therapist enters every session. We measure things as part of treatment. Now, one of the things we've tried to say is, is treatment should be measurement. So now part of doing psychological treatment is measuring things because it's a way for clients to tell us how they're doing. So the FFT CFS system, or contextualized feedback system, allows us to do treatment planning, measure adherence, see progress, and look at outcomes. So it, what's really nice is you, you've got questionnaires you've got to fill out. Those questionnaires go to a server. They can be done on an iPad. In our clinic, we give iPads to our clients in the last 10 minutes, and they fill out four or five questions. Now, we have to be really careful so they don't steal them. But if, we're, if they don't steal them, then we're good. And then what happens is that that information turns into a report, and that report gets sent back to a therapist, and here's how it works. You have a session. Oh, you have a session, and then what you get to do is it turns into a feedback loop like my car. You then reconceptualize the case, change what you're going to do, adapt FFT to fit that client in that moment, and then you move on to try again, and there's a real-time feedback loop. So, we have measures that clients complete, pre and post measures, and things that, that clinicians complete. You know what? Clients love it. 
They love it because they get to have a voice. They have input into their treatment and how it's going. And so, oh, this is what I just, this is what I'm trying to show you. So we have a session. After the session, we get the client or the therapist to conceptualize the case. They put in information and we get to find the needs of the family, the unique things, what's going on in the room, changes our identification of conceptualization, etc. And then, then, then we make the next session plan after seeing the feedback. Well, I have to tell you that busy therapists are not going to read a report. They're going to glance at something and move on. So the system we've developed is one built upon green, like a stoplight, means go. Yellow means, it's supposed to mean slow down and stop. Sometimes not. Uh, and red means stop in your tracks and pay attention. This is what a therapist sees when they log on. They see their clients. They see when their next session is. And these are indicators of the severity of the symptom of the youth. If you bring this up on your computer before you have a session, what is your eye drawn to? The red bar. You know what happens? You're able to click on that red bar, and you have all of our measures, and green, yellow, red, here's where the <coughs> client is at the current time. And it shows you, is it staying the same? Is it improving or going down? And these bullet graphs allow you just to look at it and have feedback, like my car. If you have that feedback, you can then drill down, and by clicking on it, you can look at the clinically reliable change score. You can then drill down even further, look at every question, and look at which question may be problematic. And you can look at trend lines over time to see how it's going over time. And this can be done in five minutes, not hours, as long as the system's working on it. But that's a different issue. So this is part now of what it takes to do an evidence-based treatment like FFT. You've got to have information that you're able to use to do this. FFT's come a long way. Started as a really simple idea. You know, I would, uh, the American way of saying it is it was a garage. It was based in a garage. It was a homegrown garage therapy done only by Jim and Bruce Parsons at the University of Utah. It lived that way for more than 25 years. In the, in the middle 1990s, Jim and I were working together and people wanted to do it. We had to figure out all of these things. How to think about the model in a way that makes sense. Not in an academic way, but a practical way. How to bring all the new information of those decades into the model. And how to think about training people. And more importantly, how to think about empowering therapists with the knowledge and data-based information that they need to be able to individualize treatments to families. Almost all of the evidence-based treatments are moving this way. This is not just us. This, I would suggest to you, whether you, whether you ever do FFT or not, you're going to see measurement feedback systems in your future. They're going to be part of what you do. The good news is they are a great way to gather data, so you don't have to go out and do it. They're a great way to have information. And I want to say to you that they're the best way to do these complicated, relationally-based psychological treatments. Thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Tom, will you take a couple of questions? Oh, as many as you'd like. In fact, if, I, if it's this kind of question, I can do this all day. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, I'm interested in your feedback mechanism. Are you familiar with Michael Lambert? Uh, I know Michael. I know Michael. Yeah, this is His, it's very good. The difference between it is it's built on a single set of instruments. It's built on a set of the OQ instruments. The, the OQ instruments are week by week instruments rather than longer term ones. The difference in what we're doing, and, and Michael provides these alerts, and actually the goal of Michael's work is to try to figure out when to end therapy. That's his whole job, is to try to end therapy quickly. Because his early data says, you know, everything plateaus at six, seven sessions. And then after that, most, pe most people don't need it. Our job, is, our goal is a little different. Our goal is feedback from multiple instruments, from multiple sources, from multiple perspectives around FFT-specific things. Meaning, you know, I showed you those three phases. We measure negativity. 
We measure blame. We measure the phase-specific things that therapists need in those sessions so that they can alter those very fine-tuned process things that need to happen. All the same sort of stuff, just a bit of a different approach in terms of specificity and things like that. Michael's work is really wonderful. What else? Yes. How, do, how does the family track those patterns that emerge in the therapy? So the therapist might be reflecting in his notes afterwards, but how does the family keep an eye on very sophisticated and complicated? They don't. Think of it this way. One of the very early quotes that struck me when I was in graduate school was a quote by Gregory Bates. It's only the fish that don't know that it's water in which they swim. Think about it. If you're in the middle of the pattern, you can't see it. I mean, you have a significant other in your life, right? From the very second you create a relationship, you've developed a pattern. That pattern gets to be very specific and very stable quickly. You know, you look at families and you frequently see them as chaotic. I don't see chaotic families. I see highly patterned families. It's just that the pattern does this, right? Instead of this. So patterns are there, but if you're in the middle of them, you can't see them. Which is, which is an important thing to remember in your lens because many of our therapies are about teaching people how they work in a logical, rational, reasonable way so that they can choose to be different. Families that we work with rarely know the pattern. They rarely see the pattern. It's a, it's a thing for a therapist to do. So we don't go teach them the pattern. We may point out small parts of it to accomplish one of the phase goals. But having them know the pattern is not the objective. Having them act and feel differently in relation to another, that is the objective. So when you're in the middle of it, I don't know, you have significant others in your lives, anybody? I hope there's more than the Prius owner and the magician. It's okay. Um, probably every one of you have had a few struggles with someone, with that person, right? One or two? That would hope more. Maybe not. Maybe Irish people don't struggle with their That'd be great. No, but you have struggles, right? And when you struggle, if you're like me, I, I mean, I'll tell you the truth. I'll, I'll give this personal thing. I know I'm right. <laughs> Absolutely convinced. In fact, not convinced, I know I'm right. What I know I'm right about what they need to do. But that's because I'm in the middle of it. If I could be out of it, I could see the two part. I could see what goes on between them. So the patterns are just a thing that families are just in, not something they need to know, from our perspective. Other models approach that in a different way. Other ideas, Alan? Tom, I'm just going to say, time is moving on a bit, and we're, we're at a quarter past six. So how about I say to you, you can button the whole Tom down in the common room, where we're going to have a drink in a few minutes, yes. and we'll kind of have a more informal conversation down there. And once again, I remind you, if we all follow, where's Muriel? Muriel, will you, will you lead the way down to the common room in a couple of minutes? We all follow, it's over in the B section. And what have you got down there, Muriel? A glass of wine and some fizzy water for those of you that are driving. And um, on your behalf, can I thank Tom and, and talk to so, what a wonderful presentation. Thanks.